Welcome to another bonus episode of the Underworld Podcast. I am Danny Gold, and my guest today is Monica Villamizar, who is a close friend. She is a Colombian-American reporter. She's done on-camera stuff, produced, worked for everyone from Univision to PBS NewsHour, season two of Showtime's The Trade, Vice. You know, she's gotten some of the best access you're going to see with cartels, gangs, MS-13, uh, Mexico, Honduras, Colombia. She's covered ISIS stuff, West Africa. She's been all over. She's done amazing work. She's a great reporter, someone who I turn to uh, for advice, especially in stuff in, in Latin America. You know, advice not just on stories, but on, on how to stay safe and, and how to interact in dangerous places. So uh, please enjoy the interview and definitely follow up and, and pay attention to Monica's work. So why don't you start off by just kind of introducing yourself uh, and telling us some of the uh, some of the assignments that you've done that have to do with organized crime, cartels, gangs. I, I know there's a lot of them. Um, so I have um, worked extensively pretty much in four countries, uh, Honduras, Mexico, Colombia and El Salvador. Um, I've also covered in Haiti, Jamaica, you know, drug gangs and stuff there, uh, but mainly, mainly those countries and um, a, a region that I know very well and that I've sort of specialized on is Reynosa, Tamaulipas in Mexico, um, where the Gulf Cartel and the Zetas uh, have a pretty mute firm stronghold over, you know, pretty much everything that goes on there, government, etc., um, and, um, obviously Colombia and the new cartels in Medellin. Yeah. You, you I mean, you're, you grew up in Col Colombia, I think, right. Or you went back and forth between Colombia and the States. Right. I actually, my parents are both from Cali in Colombia. Um, I know the son of the Cali cartel boss, you know, for me growing up, uh, we sort of, uh, know a lot of these people and their kids, uh, and we would. Uh, you know, hang out with their children and stuff. So I am very much part of that generation um, that grew up in Colombia. And when Cali and Medellin were both uh, centers of drug traffic, very important centers of drug tra trafficking and very much controlled by the two main cartels, Pablo Escobar and the Rodriguez Orejuela in Cali. How do you think that affects, you know, how you look at this and how you do these stories about the drug war? I mean, we, you know, forget just international journalists, but I think even a lot of journalists from Colombia or Mexico maybe don't have that sort of personal connection that you have. How does it, how does it sort of, how does it, how does it sort of affect the way that you do these stories and, and how you view things? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I really haven't thought of it much. I think, well, there's a couple of things. I think most Colombian people would probably agree with me on this and it's not only journalists but we grow we grew in a country that was ravaged by drug trafficking and by traffickers and there were car bombs and escobar you know blew up a plane once i don't know if you remember everybody died in the plane because he just wanted to kill one person so as a colombian you are kind of used to um not only this climate of violence but you develop kind of a sixth sense you always kind of know if someone's doing shady business or if someone's involved with drug trafficking um i remember growing up my parents and uncles and everybody would talk about like oh this person's you know making money he's you know starting to hang out and do business with a cartel um it's something that's kind of affects all aspects of your life and it's very strange and you get used to when you learn how to navigate the violence that is very um typical of uh you know to the to a, a country that is living uh a drug war so mexicans would understand this right now more recently but it's this type of violence where you can be kidnapped anytime where you can be tortured you know i remember being a teenager and stuff you go out and you know to dance to a nightclub with your boyfriend but if a, a son of a drug trafficker liked you you had to dance with him there, there was just no other choice you know and it's it's a very strange life that we kind of learned to navigate and I think that's been useful as a reporter covering these stories. Has it affected the way you report in Colombia? I mean, have you had to be concerned? You, have, you still have family there, you know? So it's like one thing if you're reporting there and you don't have anyone in the country, but it's another if you're reporting on these issues and you have family in the country as well. 
Absolutely. I don't do anything in Colombia. I mean, I, I try not to do anything in Colombia anymore. And that's precisely because of that. I'm, I still have family there. And um, I am very worried that uh, if someone doesn't like the, re the things I report on, they can take it against my family. So that's yes, I, 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 I try to stay away from those stories. Um, I mean, the last thing I did in Medellin was also a you know, didn't turn out very well in, in the sense that our fixer was threatened and we had a lot of, of problems. So I, I try not to do anything, you know, at least for TV and stuff, which which, as you know, Danny, I mean, it's a lot harder because you, you're filming and, you know, you can't really, you know, change names. And as, when you're writing a book or writing an article, I mean, it's a lot more difficult. But you haven't exactly, you know, shied away from from these sort of big stories with cartels and things like that. I think one of the more interesting things you you were kind of telling me recently was about how the sort of main focus of these powerful cartels, the power shifted from Mexico to Colombia. I mean from Colombia to Mexico and there was like this transition moment. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean I've always sort of been fascinated. Well, my first kind of big question was always why weren't the Mexicans in charge of everything from the start, right? From the get-go. They share a huge border with the biggest consumer which is the US. Um they have a geographic advantage, etc. But historically, it was the Colombian cartels that were sort of more ruthless, more business oriented. Um Pablo Escobar was, you know, a typical kind of insurer. Uh, he you kind of paid him an insurance, you know. He was really big on the distribution side and that's what made the business flourish to that extent. Uh, because you know, the first major drug trafficker wasn't even Colombian. It was a Peru Peruvian guy known as the Vatican, and he uh, grew coca, and Colombians would buy um, the leaf, the coca leaf on bulk, and then um, were became big distributors, and then they became sort of the kings and the, the bosses of, of everyone, including the Mexicans. I mean, the Mexicans would obviously help, like the Arellano Felix uh, cartel, etc. They would help, and they would have alliances whereby they could just ship the product, the merchandise across to the United States. But in terms of power, the Colombians really had that power. And now it's clearly the Mexicans to the point um, which in which, at which the, the Sinaloans, I mean, you hear that they go to Colombia and kind of take care of the process from A to Z. Um, that hasn't really been proven, but it seems that the whole chain is now controlled by the Mexicans, or at least they have the last word because they have such powerful networks at the entry point, which is Mexico. Or even if you're going to ship cocaine, for instance, in a semi-submersible and take it from Colombia's Chocó or Buenaventura in the Pacific all the way to Guatemala, it's still Mexican cartels who you're probably going to have to deal with in Guatemala who will then, you know, take it all the way up to California by boat or by land, you know, through the U.S. border. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that about the cart, the Mexican cartels actually going down to Colombia and, and sort of being there from the get go, from the start. Absolutely. That's I mean, that's what, you know, people are hearing right now. Um, and exactly that would have been absolutely uh, impossible in the 80s or when the Cali cartel or Escobar uh, were, you know, the main players or even, you know, the, the Northern Valley cartel, because everybody had their turf. And again, there were these kind of made very big um, deals, alliances with between different groups, but nobody sort of messed on, with anybody's turf. And now. I mean, just the amount of drugs and the the different kind of drugs that are being trafficked as well. And that's something really important has made, you know, the, that has, has meant that the Mexicans have the upper hand. For instance, like, we're not only talking about cocaine now anymore. There's fentanyl. Um, there's fentanyl that's being produced in Mexico without Chinese uh, supplies after COVID, for instance. There is heroin, there's meth you know, and all these drugs that are, that don't need to be sort of manufactured and refined and processed in Colombia. Yeah. And we hear too, you know, it's not just Colombians and Mexicans, obviously the Venezuelans have a, have a pretty large cartel that has connections all the way up to the top of the government. And you got into some trouble there. Yeah. I mean, were you reporting on cartel stuff or was it something different? <laughs> 
No, no. You know, it's really, it's, it was really kind of a, not a great, I did this story, which was very straightforward of TV piece. I mean, I would love to say that it was, you know, thanks to a major investigative piece, but it wasn't at all the case. I was, I mean, I know Nicolas Maduro personally, because I covered. Yeah, of, co- um, of course you do somehow. <laughs> well, I covered I covered uh, the coup in Honduras, and I don't know if you remember at the time Nicolas Maduro was Chavez's foreign minister, and he was just hanging around with Zelaya when he was stuck at the border, and I was uh, a reporter, uh, like a news reporter back then, covering that story. So I, you know, I got to know him, a very sort of quiet, strange man, and when I went to Venezuela. Um, I did a, a report about because Maduro used to be a bus driver and then he cl- kind of climbed the ranks and now he's president. So I did a story about what bus drivers thought about him. And for some reason, it wasn't even like a hard hitting story, but uh, it really annoyed uh, the regime. And uh, I was threatened that I would be arrested. They said I didn't have credentials. And um, Diosdado Cabello, who is the head of supposedly the head of this cartel that you mentioned, the Cartel of the Sons, um, because, you know, generals in the military in Venezuela have sons as, a, as opposed to stars. Like, you're not a four-star general, you're like a four-son general. Um, and and he, um, he was the one who signaled me on TV and said I was a CIA spy and I had to leave the country and it was all, you know, very dramatic. So um, that was my story in Venezuela. But um, yeah, Diosdado Cabello is, is, is a horrible, you know, it's a terrible person. And, and, and he really is uh, accused of being one of the main players of this massive cartel that ships cocaine to Colombia and, uh, you know, to the U.S., I just I, I love the idea that out of all the work you've done, whether it's been on like jihadis <laughs> in West Africa, cartels, all that gangs, MS-13, all that. The thing that gets you in the most trouble is uh, is a bus driver story. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, it was ridiculous, I think. And it was really it was kind of funny and absurd because um all the media doesn't really exist in Ven- like independent media doesn't exist in Venezuela, at least mass media. So everybody was taking to Twitter and I tweeted something that really upset them because I tweeted a woman who was showing me a mark on her on her forearm. They were giving numbers to people to, you know, queue up for food. And it was kind of a weird very powerful, you know, reminder of like the Holocaust when you're giving a number or something and, and and it went viral. And I think they were also quite upset about that because at the time they really couldn't control Twitter. I mean, things have changed and now I don't know if Twitter is that important in Venezuela, but back then it really was like the only means of getting some kind of free information out there. I, I also love how like, you know, I've known you for I don't know, five, seven, eight, nine years now, and <laughs> yeah. plenty of com- plenty of conversations about like even Venezuela. I mean, you're one of the people I call for advice when I'm looking to do an assignment that's particularly dangerous. And then in this interview right here is when I first learned that like you know Nicolas Maduro. You know, that's just like I mean, that's a perfect example <laughs> of talking to you. It's just like yeah, I you know yeah, I happen to know the the guy who's currently in charge of Venezuela. But then also, you know, you've met. I think it was the guy of Los Viagras, right? Or Las Viagras, uh, Nicolas Sierra, uh, Sierra. Yes, yes. The head of a cartel in Mexico. Like, how did, how did that come about? So um, that was a funny story. El Gordo, they know him as El Gordo, the fat one. Uh, Nicolas Sierra, he is the head of the Viagras, which is, it was kind of a small time drug gang. Now they've grown way more powerful since, I mean, I met him when they were somewhat powerful, but I think they're, they're a bigger deal now. They're part of Carteles Unidos, who are waging a brutal war against uh, Jalisco New Generation right now, as we speak. I mean, the guy is wanted and there's a bounty on his head, etc. But um, I met him when he was sort of really upset and disappointed at uh, some government figure that let him down. You know, it's it's this whole story that was really complex, Danny. I don't know if you remember about the self-defenses and everybody was saying these men are super brave and they're arming themselves up against the cartels, but they actually became yeah, super yeah, yeah. powerful cartels themselves. Um, so it was in that weird transition where I met him and he was in hiding and... Um, 
he was like, I, I will never forget. He was eating like a ton of chicken, like a really greasy kind of fried chicken. And he was like devouring that chicken and sort of like really Just living up to his <laughs> living up to his nickname. Yeah, exactly. And the cameraman kept looking at me like, oh, my God, that chicken looks so good. And and we were like the, he was really nice and he gave us some food. And it's this kind of really weird world that, you know, pretty well as well of 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 these men that are so strange, they're so ruthless and brutal but yet you can also connect with them on some kind of human level you know he was very like i say very polite um and then he had these roosters that uh, you know f that fight he likes you know you know in mexico they have like rooster fights and he showed us that yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. why that's why the his brothers are called the viagras because of some kind of rooster connection is not viagra like the drug like everybody thinks um Oh yeah, but and it's like that would be that that'd be funnier. It's you know? really funny. I mean, it was it, he was like he was like a really, you know, if you didn't know what this guy really who he really is and what he did, you would be totally kind of like what a what a you know nice really nice kind of gentle person. But obviously that's that's not the case. And I think that's what's really interesting about um, this underworld in Latin America. It's this kind of you have a tiny window where these people show some kind of humanity. Um, and then that's, that's a, a place that lets you connect with them. But obviously they are also capable of doing very cruel and brutal things. Yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. What's like, you know, I know when I go in, my general strategy is just to be like an agreeable idiot, you know, just to smile and shake hands and do all that stuff. What's like your approach, A, in securing access and then B, when you come face to face with these people, whether it's gang members, cartel guys, just, you know, kind of people that are extremely dangerous? Right. I mean, it's it's a good question. And I think it's really case by case. But as a general rule, I mean, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I try, you know, being a woman is also very different because you're not into this kind of weird alpha male competition <laughs> from the start. So that's very helpful. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, you know, all these men are thinking like, you know, in, into like, I don't know, they're into like being macho and alpha. So if they may not like a male reporter or feel threatened by his presence but that doesn't really happen with a woman so that is very helpful you are you arrive there and like i said there's they're macho and stuff so most of the time they either want to brag and show off to you or they're sometimes you know nice and try to be like gentleman style believe it or not oh, yeah. I've, I've had you know these people be very gentleman like to me um i I think, you know, regardless, it's important to know that for these people to talk to you and especially for TV and be filmed, etc., they have to have a motivation for doing so. And thinking otherwise is just naive. So I think a lot of the times it's it's just better to be straightforward and be like, I'm offering, um, I, you know, if you give me access, I'm offering you this, which means you know, you will get to tell your story, uh, you get to tell the world that you get to become immortal. You know what I mean? Like negotiating some kind of thing, uh, obviously, because, you know, reporters, we can't pay, but you, you know, you play on their ego or whatever can be a motivation for them to, to come forth and speak because it's obviously not on their advantage for, you know, when you think about it, they have a lot to lose, but they can also have something to gain. And I think it's just finding that small, um, element that they can gain and sort of uh, that that's your end with them mostly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I, I think it's, it's just trying to, trying to persuade them that they have, um, that like you're, you're someone who's going to tell their side, you know, as corny as that sounds and as patronizing as it sounds, I think there's like, there's right ways of doing that, but yeah, I don't know. Are, are there moments for you when it's gone really wrong? Or like who out of the people that you've met, I mean, you've done what, like FARC, you've done jihadists in West Africa, ISIS stuff, cartel guys, MS-13, like who has concerned you the most? Like when have you been the most worried when meeting someone face to face? I, I think, you know, I'm not so concerned when the access has been agreed upon or negotiated. I mean, I think... Believe it or not, that world is more old school in the sense that if someone gives you access and, and it's been agreed upon, they will most likely stick to the word. I think what's really dangerous is either when you run into someone else or their enemy or someone seen as their rival, 
um, and you're seen as a potential snitch or when there's a police operation and you are seen as a potential cause for that police operation or something. And that's when you really have to worry. Um, we were very worried with my boyfriend, uh, who's also a reporter and you know him also. We were worried in Colombia because we, we did quite a big story on a, a cartel in Medellin and then there was a huge, like, fallback, you know, the backlash. Authorities raided a bunch of people and they really linked us to it. So we were immediately in danger and that was really unpleasant and very scary. But, um, for the most part, you try to, like I say, I mean, once you meet someone face to face, I'm not really too concerned because I think that these people are not, once they agree to do something, they're not going to change their mind. It's it's sort of what's surrounding or after or, you know, what happens after you publish your piece or, or just, you know, what happens in these areas. I mean, I remember once I was in Mexico and we went into a house thinking that it was an abandoned ranch of El Nazario Moreno, El Chayo. I don't know if you remember that myth, the, the crazy drug trafficker who was into cannibalism and all these crazy things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to do an episode. Well, on we him. went up to his house, right? Like to his former ranch, because my <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. well, my producer, um, who I'm, I'm not gonna say his name because this was quite embarrassing for him. He had read some article that that the ranch was empty because the police took took you know raided it and and it was occupied by the police or whatever and it was sort of abandoned. But the article had a different. He mistook the date of the article, so he read and he was basing this in a really old article. So we just kind of rocked up to his house, and a bunch of Templar cartel members were there, and it was an active place and they were completely in shock that we would show up with a camera i mean they were almost like more in shock than we were when we saw them there and they um obviously detained us and questioned us and looked at all the footage and it was really unpleasant but um it's the kind of things that happen when you're you know it's this kind of surprise things that happen that could go really badly if you don't know how to react what to say how to prove that you really are who you are and you're not police or dea normally which is you know what they're mostly concerned about but also like a spy or a rival um i have a colombian accent which is you know people in mexico pick it up immediately so that is not very helpful too in, in some cases that's it's not no, helpful? No, because, you know, they, they just oh, don't they trust assume Colombians that you're with, yeah. and they see them as, you know, rivals or, or a snitch. You know, it's, it's um yeah, it's it's not very, it's not a good accent to have, <laughs> I must say. In some cases it is, but in some cases yeah. it, it isn't. Yeah, I, I like in the, those situations when you run into people like that in the middle of something when neither one of you is expecting to see the other. It's like running into a bear in the woods, you know, like... They, they probably won't hurt you, but you have to know the right way of, of handling the situation and getting out of there without getting yourself hurt. Exactly. Um, I want to I want to switch it up a bit because I think, you know, we've talked about all the gangs and narcos and all the dangerous people. But, you know, I think some of the best work you've done is with the people that are affected by all this, you know, civilians, people sort of caught in the middle, um, not not law enforcement, not criminals, but the people that that have to suffer sort of the excesses of both. Yeah. And yeah. one of the one of the thing one of the things you did recently I think that was amazing, you know, you spent like a year, right, on on the trade season 2 if you guys haven't seen it, the trade on Showtime, there's two seasons. It's incredible. The first season is about drug trafficking, the second is about people trafficking or smuggling, however you want to frame it. But can you talk a little bit about that experience what that was like? Yeah, no, thanks so much for for all of that and and uh for also, you know, mentioning this really important aspect i agree with you i mean for every kind of cartel or gang out there there are so many people that suffer unfairly uh you know i mean i know you're familiar with el salvador and honduras is a similar case you have so many people who are hardworking citizens and it really sucks that they're in a situation where a bunch of stupid teenagers and young adults with guns, you know, kind of ruin their lives and, and extort them and they have to pay part of their salary to them. And everything, all they're trying to do is, you know, to, to do like be, you know, decent people and, and go on and, and, you know, have a decent job and stuff. I think it's, 
it's really like a tragedy. All the migrants, everybody that has been threatened has to flee because they don't want to pay extortion and all of that. There's so many victims. We see like a glorification of these cartels and gangs and stuff, but we don't see the human cost and the human suffering. Even countries like my country, Colombia and Mexico, the number of people who have been murdered in the drug wars, it's absolutely tragic. And it, that byproduct, people don't focus on, but it's it's really detrimental and it's harming societies there in a very, very big way. Um, you have places in slums and Medellin, et cetera, where people just don't want to work because all you see is, you know, young, young men who start in the drug trade and, and, you know, make money and they don't live very long, but nobody else wants to work. So it's like, it's like a cancer, you know, in the whole of society. And I think... I mean, being able to follow migrants for this show that you were mentioning for the Showtime um, series, The Trade, was great because we really got to sort of experience uh, what it's like to be someone who wants to migrate from Central America to North America. I mean, me and my crew, we went, we did that route about seven times altogether um, by train, being smuggled ourselves with coyotes, um, by car. We, you know, we did it like sort of back and forth and back and forth to try to understand and see the dynamics. And really what you see is a bunch of very, very brave people, sort of the bravest who want to leave and risk it all, you know, in order to have a better future and be able to feed their kids. So it's really like a sad story. I mean, it's something that really affects me personally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, like people, I think, in the U.S., especially who who are very vehemently anti-immigrant and don't sort of understand what these people are going through and why they're coming here. Uh, once you go down there and you actually talk to the people that are there and see what it is, it's it's kind of shocking how callous they're treated um, by the system in the U.S. But anyway, yeah, I want to switch it up again just because, you know, I, I think one of the things our, our listeners find really interesting and one of the, thing, the questions I always get is how I got started in this. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you've done on camera, you've done pro production, directing, you've worked for, I said in the intro, I think everyone, you know, Univision, HBO, Showtime, Vice, PBS NewsHour. How did you, how did you kind of find yourself in this world where you're having these experiences? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're, it's, it's, you're right. It's something that people often ask and they're, and it's, it's obviously di interesting and very different for each person. I, I mean, in my particular case, it wasn't a very sort of usual path, I don't think. I was, uh, I studied political science. I was living in Europe. And when I started journalism, um, TV journalism in Colombia, there was the, basically one day I realized that all these people covering the conflict in Colombia were foreign and um, in English, obviously, they're covering it for, you know, BBC, CNN, etc. And I thought to myself, I, I want to work in English and I want to cover Colombia for an English network because I think I have something to add and I know the, the nuances and I know the country better. And that's how I started in TV and in journalism in general. I, I was hired by Al Jazeera English and I worked with them in the Middle East and in, in a, a bunch of different places. And then um, I went to CBS and then ABC. And then I thought, like, I just I want to freelance and I want to cover the stories that are important for me because you know, being staff for a news network is also is also a bit of a grind. I mean, you're doing a ton of stories and some of them you like, but a lot of them you don't. So um, that was a very personal choice. And, you know, thankfully, it's really worked for me. But you have to kind of stay on your feet all the time and work a lot more when you're freelance. And you have to develop a lot of sources. So um, that's why, you know, I try to keep in touch with, with all these people that I meet, especially in the underworld, because I know that sometimes, you know, they will lead me to bigger stories and to understand criminal trends and things that are going on that then I can, you know, pitch to different networks. Yeah. I think one of the things I, I really admire about you too, is that, you know, you're, you're very experienced in this. You've been doing it longer than I have. And you, you kind of advise all of us, all the people, sort of my, my experience level and, and beneath us, I, I, you know, all the uh, people who worked at Vice when I was there and, and younger and all that. You know, we always look to you as someone who is is sort of tireless, a in 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 working, but b in also in sort of helping us out with with what we're doing, and and just your level of energy <laughs> is uh is something that I'm en envious of. But that's so sweet. Thanks so much, Danny. 
Yeah, no, seriously. Like, I, I, I mean, I, I say a lot of good things about you behind your back. So I figured I would say it in front of your face too. <laughs> like, I, you're someone I always count on who, who will, you know, tell me about other opportunities in the industry itself. Um, who help, you know, I can lament the current like state of the industry as well. And then just ad advice in terms of keeping myself safe. Like you're one of the first people I look to. Um, but how do you think the industry's changed? You know, you've been doing this work. Um, I don't want to say a while, but, but, you know, for, for longer than I have, you're experienced. Like, how do you think the industry has changed since you started working in it? And how have you adapted to that? sort of helping each other out and um, people who maybe care a lot more about the story and less about themselves. And I think journalism has, has become very uh, narcissistic and, and very much about my followers and this. And, and it's just like so boring. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really not about the person. I think that no, sucks, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm really disillusioned sometimes. Um, yeah. I think there's no secret, you know, it's all about hard work and you have to put the put in the work uh, in terms of go go to go in the field and or make your your meet your sources or get your scoops or whatever. But it all takes its legwork. It's not about just showing up and having social media and, you know, all these stupid things. Um, it's become very stupid, I think. Sadly. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And, and, and I'd like I'm trying to lean into the stupidity a little bit, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's different from, from even like five or 10 years ago, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not just, I definitely think there's that camaraderie among freelancers, right. In terms of helping people out, but it doesn't mean that everyone's like that with their time and with their sort of access and stories and stuff like that. And, uh, not everyone's generous, you know, especially with the, with time because your energy level gets depleted, having to deal with the industry and all that, but you always seem to, to make time for me. And I think not just me, but all the other people I think I know trying to do this and, and, you know, we're, we're very appreciative of that. Uh, what do you have? What do you I have? Mean, coming? Look, I, I think it's definitely like a hamster wheel for sure. You know, I can't lie and say like, I'm not, I, I feel like I work so much on the whole time and it doesn't get easier, but it does get more interesting <laughs> now that I've had, you know, the, the opportunity to work with people like at Showtime and directors like Matt Heineman, and Alex Gibney and stuff. It's, it, you know, it's, it's become a lot more interesting and I think it's worth it. I think you do need kind of like to be very hyperactive like myself and have a ton of energy because you are against, you're swimming against the current the whole time. And it'll never get easier. But I think that's every profession. I mean, if you ask a Hollywood director or whatever, they work their ass off, you know, until pretty much, you know, they stop. So I don't think journalism is any different in that sense. But if, if it's your passion and if it's what you like, and if you get bored doing other stuff, I think, you know, it's definitely worth it. No, I, I agree with you on that, especially, you know, like uh, anything, what, what you want to do, especially in the creative field, like it's stressful and you've got to go against the current. But the chances of being murdered because you make a mistake are way less, I think, for a Hollywood director than for someone who does the kind of work that you do. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's why you develop other skills, too. Exactly. Different, when the stakes stresses. are so high, you are always going to you're sort of like, you know, in that sense, you're similar. It's similar to people who are in the army or et cetera. Right. You're working right, under like, exactly. extreme conditions the whole time. Um, so it just makes you more sharp or more aware and, and there's just training for that. I think it's like a different level of adrenaline that firefighters and people like that have. It's, it's kind of one of those professions, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and a different way of wearing you out. What do you have, um, coming up? I know you were, I don't know if you can talk about it. You were just in El Salvador. Did you did you, you were, did you work on that COVID documentary too? I did. I spent 
Yeah, I spent like um I worked there. I worked f- with them for in the beginning for like a month. It was the hardest month, I think, because it was all of April when, you know, New York was the epicenter pretty much of COVID in the world and we were inside a hospital. So that was very traumatic and and something that I really really didn't enjoy uh because there was sort of it was just very grim and tragic and sad and you know, it was really hard to establish human contact with people, not only because of all the PPE that we had to to wear, but, you know, the, the circumstances were horrific. Um, so, but, you know, I, I think it's a very important and I, I'm very proud of, of the work, but it wasn't, you know, personally, it took a toll, I think, I must say. Um, now I'm back to sort of, uh, I'm working on something uh, on fentanyl in Mexico. And... Um, and I'm going to go to Honduras and El Salvador soon as well. So I'm, I'm kind of back to those beats, uh, you know, crime and the underworld and, and gangs. Yeah, all that, all that fun stuff. What do you... All that fun like, stuff, exactly. What do you want to do? I mean, what's like the... Is there a story or like a project that you've wanted to do for a long time that, that would be like a goal for the next year or two or just something that you haven't been able to tackle? I I have a a goal for sure. Um, it's it's sort of very generic, but I would love to direct my own documentary. I think uh, there's a lot of of talented people, women especially. And I'm, I'm talking on behalf of women. You know, I think it's it's time to have more women directors, more women reporters, uh, more BIPOC. You know, people of color. Uh, you know at the forefront of the stories and the journalism. So I'm excited to, you know, I want to be part of that. And I think I want to, you know, I feel like I've I've almost gotten access and produced a lot of stuff for other people. I want to do stuff for myself now, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And you've definitely, I think, um, earned the right, maybe much more so than, than a lot of people who get that opportunity, I would say. It's a, it's a tough world out there, Danny, you know how it is. (laughs) Uh, yeah, where can where can people see your work? Where can they follow you on social media? Like, what where uh, where can we keep up? Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty active on um, Twitter. It's Monica underscore VV, V as in Victor, V as in Victor, um, and Monica via Mizar on Instagram. And I sometimes post on Facebook, but less so. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm part of a show called Criminal Planet that's going to go out on Vice TV. It's produced by Vice UK, so I'm excited about that. And um, I do some stuff for PBS, the News Hour as well. So you know, I'm, I try to, I try to do stuff for different outlets. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 uh, you know, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. Unless, is there anything else you want to add? Um, no. Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to. I, I think. You know, I think I don't know if you agree with me on this, but since you've covered the Middle East uh, like myself and we've covered similar things, something that I think is interesting for people who f- who listen to your podcast, which is great, by the way. Thank you. And I really enjoy it, um, is that I think, you know, Latin American crime and criminal structures. What I like about doing the job is that you can sympathize, identify, understand why people are driven to those choices a lot better than when you're dealing with some, you know, terrible, crazy jihadi where there's just absolutely nothing in common with that person and you could never sympathize or understand the brutality and the choices they make. So I think that's what's fascinating about the underworld in Latin America. If you're talking about drug cartels or or gangs, you know, the MS is fascinating, for instance, for me, I've, I've traveled, I've, you know, talked to them for so long, and I've met so many of them. It's almost like a way of socializing and having a family in a very cruel society where they have no mother figure or father figure. So I, you know, I think that's, that's why I'm always sort of endlessly fascinated by that world. And I think that's why it's so different than just covering terrorism, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know if, if you agree. I, I, I do, in, in, I think, in, in, in a lot of respects. I mean, you kind of hinted at that with your watching uh, El Gordo just pound some chicken away, you know, where it was like this, uh, these brief moments where it's almost like they're, they're comical in a way, you know? And, and, and it's absurd that this guy who can seem so normal and goofy in one moment is butchering someone like, you know, the day before, the day after. Exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, I think um, I think that's what makes it more, you know, interesting. And I think that's why people are interested in what we do in your podcast and, you know, in all these groups. Um, these people are highly smart, you know, and the technology and the creative stuff they they come up with. Um, it, but, you know, obviously they're also capable of a lot of brutality and that's that's terrible. Yeah, and it's interesting to to kind of look into why, you know, they become what they become because it doesn't always start out that way you know like everyone starts out like this but it's sort of these environments that they're they're raised in and they sort of acclimate i think to the the terrible violence and everything like that yeah exactly exactly i think it's it's pretty much their product of of our system our society and you know the inequalities in latin america so i think when you see it through that prism you kind of understand it's it's just poverty and lack of education and social mobility and they know that the poor know that they'll never be able to do anything else so you know it's it's very tragic and unless that changes you know nothing else is going to change i think that's a that's a good point to uh to end it on so thank you monica yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for your time and for telling us these stories and everything um everyone check out her shows and her website and all that good stuff Thanks so much, Danny. I loved talking to you as always. And I love the podcast as well. So keep it up. <laughs>